Good evening. I hope you're doing well this Wednesday evening. As if you're here in Eastern North Carolina, you, you've been out with uh, your umbrella, uh, rain jacket. Uh, we've gotten a lot of rain this week, but maybe not quite as much as we thought we were going to get. Those of you who are aware of uh, Jake having his stay at home, stay in the city mission trip, it has gone very, very well. The rain held off until late um, Monday afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, so that they could get a lot of things done. And so that has allowed things to go a lot better than he was fearful they would go. And uh, they're out and about doing things even as I speak now. And so I'm uh, glad that we've had 40 plus kids here for the mission trip. I think that was a few more than what Jake anticipated, but that's a good thing. And so uh, hopefully uh, the rain will hold off and then go to King's Dominion tomorrow. For our purposes this evening, I would invite you to open your Bibles with me, your electronic devices, if you prefer that, to Luke chapter 8. If you've been being with me on these Wednesday nights, you'll recall that we finished up our study through 1 John last week. And so now I'm, I'm in between. And, and sometimes I will do maybe one, two, three or more standalone sermons, I call them, before I get back into a different series. Well, I've decided to actually go with a, a little mini series of messages. These are actually some sermons that I preached probably 10 years ago, but anytime I revisit whether it's a sermon or a series of sermons, I'm always going to freshen them up and, and put you know contemporary uh, illustrations to them, etc. So this series is going to be called Lifted Spirits, when, Why Jesus Said, Be of Good Courage. So the series title is Lifted Spirits, Why Jesus Said, Be of Good Cheer. So we're going to end up looking at four different passages where Jesus says something to that effect. Be of good cheer, uh, be encouraged, lift your spirits, in other words. And my title for this evening's message is The Healer is Here. The healer is here. We're going to be in Luke chapter 8, but there are also other gospel uh, accounts of this historical event in Mark chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 9. So a few years ago, I read a news story about a young lady by the name of Rachel Todd. She was a British teenager. She was 18 years old. She was aspiring to be a fashion model, and she had a stroke. At 18, she had a stroke. That stroke left her paralyzed from head to toe. The only thing she could move were her eyes. And so therefore, the only means of communication were with her eyes. This stroke led to what doctors call the locked-in syndrome. The locked-in syndrome. It's almost like being buried alive. You can't move anything. Her father said, it breaks my heart to see my beautiful daughter like this. Rachel loved fashion, he said. She had been to London to get her photos done for her modeling portfolio. And now look at her. She's fed through a tube and needs 24-hour care. There's no cure for the locked-in syndrome. Um, the life expectancy is, is not long. People are prone to infections. And so when you hear something like this, if, if, if you have a heart at all, your heart goes out to her. And of course, it's things like this and all the other forms of pain and suffering that we know is all over the world that causes naysayers and atheists to argue that there's no God, at least not the kind of God we claim that there is. They would say that if God is all powerful, then he's not good. And if we're going to claim that he's good, then he can't be all-powerful. Because there's no way they argue that there can be a good, all-powerful God because of all the pain and suffering that exists. Well, we can't just disregard their question. It's a valid question. And how do you go about answering the question, why is there so much pain and suffering in this world? Well, you cannot answer that question without going back to Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. Of course, we're not going to go there, but we know that in Genesis 1 and 2, God created all things in those six 24-hour periods, and everything was good. It was perfect. And then man, in the person of Adam, sinned brought a curse upon the world, brought an intruder into the world, and that 
changed everything. That intruder was death in everything that comes along with and leads to death. And so therefore, if someone were to ask exactly why do we have pain and suffering today, my answer would be this, and I believe this is the biblical answer. Pain and suffering are the natural consequences of a cursed world. They're the natural consequences of a cursed world. And so when we come to our passage here in Luke chapter 8, we're going to see more evidences of pain and suffering. Now, many of you will recall Gary Maines, who was the pastor at Unity when I came on board initially for those nine months as youth pastor. And many of you, if you remember Gary and Ann Maines and their family, you'll remember Mitchell. And old Mitchell was a piece of work, boy. And uh, on this particular day, Mitchell uh, was staying with Gary. He was there at the office. I want to think that maybe he couldn't go to school or I, I don't remember all that part. All I know is he was at the church and he was running around the church and he fell and he hit his forehead on one of those wooden beams that you'll remember if you can recall the old church sanctuary. He hit one of those wooden beams and I'm going to tell you what, he had a goose egg come up on his forehead and it looked troubling just to look at it. And so Gary and I, we, we jumped in the vehicle. Gary was holding his son. His son was screaming and hollering and crying. And Gary asked me to take him to the hospital. And so we're going down 14th Street over to the hospital. I was already going past the speed limit. And Gary said, could you go even a little quicker? And so we did. We hurriedly made our way to the hospital. The anxiety in Gary as a father of a hurting son reminds me of the kind of anxiety that we see this uh, manifests in a man by the name of Jarius. Now, back in Mitchell's case, he would be okay. I don't even think he was ever diagnosed with a concussion. He was okay. In this case, with Jarius and the, the, the anxiousness with which he goes to find Jesus to provide healing for his daughter, his situation and his daughter's situation is even more dire. We pick up our text in chapter 40, I mean, verse 40 of Luke chapter 8. So it was when Jesus returned, he returned from the country of the Gadarenes. There he had just recently um, delivered someone from demon possession. So when Jesus returned, that, that, that's when the multitude welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And behold, there came a man named Jairus, and he was a ruler of the synagogue. And he fell down at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years of age, and she was dying. She was dying. So Jarius, he's the ruler of a synagogue, which means he's, he's the main man at this local place of worship. He probably is the one who oversaw the, the worship services. Maybe he was a blending of uh, what Kevin does and picking out which songs they're going to sing, which scriptures we're going to read, and then perhaps a blending of, of me and, and giving a word of explanation, a word of exhortation from those scriptures. And Jarius being a religious ruler lets us know that not all the rulers turned against Jesus. This man, while I do not know exactly his position on Jesus' messiahship, he did have enough confidence in Jesus to believe that if he could get Jesus to come to his house, Jesus could do something about the impending death of his daughter. And so he goes to him and he does not come at night. He's not concerned about who's going to see him. He knows probably he's going to catch some flack from this from his peers, but he doesn't care. Bring it on. I'm more concerned about my daughter's health than I am about my reputation. And so unlike Nicodemus who came at night, Jarius comes out in broad daylight with a multitude of people around. And his heart is burdened. He wants so, um, so, so much for Jesus to come and minister to his daughter. And when he reaches Jesus, he puts aside all personal dignity and just bows down at Jesus' feet and begs him to come. He begs him to come. Now, in the first century, a 12-year-old girl would be approaching marriageable age and entering the prime of life. And yet, listen to the confidence that Jairus has in Jesus' ability 
to heal his daughter. Mark chapter 5 verse 23 says, come and lay your hand on her and she will live. His faith was without reservation. There's not one hint of doubt. He didn't, he didn't even say, if it be your will. He just said, Lord, you come, you lay your hand on her, and she'll be healed. I believe that with every fiber of my being. That's the kind of confidence that he has. And so Jairus and his daughter, though, they're not the only needy people in this scene. Pick up with me in verses 43 and 44. We're going to find out there's another needy person, a needy woman. Verse 43. Now, a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, she came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately her flow of blood stopped. So, just as Jairus' daughter had known 12 years of laughter and life, with her family, this woman had known 12 years of misery and ostracism from her family. You see, according to Old Testament Judaistic law, if a woman is having this cycle of blood or if there is some other reason for there to be this type of flow of blood, she was ritualistically unclean. And so during that period of time, you cannot be a part of the, uh, the worship at the synagogue. And in her case, there's been this flow of blood, maybe from a tumor or some other health issue in her uterus. We, we, we don't know the specifics. That's, not, that, that's beside the point. But for 12 years, this has existed. For 12 years, she's been going to see one doctor after another. And over the course of these 12 years, she spent all her money. And nobody has been able to offer any healing. She's not been able to be with her family like any other woman would want to be. And so she's just in a very desperate state. Um, now, uh, Luke simply tells us, since Luke's a doctor, he makes it seem as if there's no cure for her. Mark has a slightly different perspective. In Mark's gospel account, I don't think he's concerned about protecting the medical profession at all. Listen to what he writes. She had endured much at the hands of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was not helped at all, but rather had grown worse. And so um, this woman had suffered physically for these 12 years. She suffered socially and emotionally, and she has suffered financially. So she's a very needy lady. All of those failures by all of these doctors underscores the fact that Jesus can succeed when all other sources have failed. Oh, and by the way, it didn't cost you anything to have faith. And so she exercises her faith. And just like Jesus exercised the demon in the previous portion of Scripture, when others had been unable to, he now will heal her when no other physician had been able to. So uh, we get another glimpse from Mark's gospel account in Mark 5, 28 about her confidence in what Jesus could do. If I can only touch his clothes, his garment, I will be well. And sure enough, after years of agony and embarrassment, they are all reversed in one brief touch. Verse 45, and Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, I mean, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, somebody touched me, for I perceived power going out from me. Um, now, when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. Now, maybe as you're reading that, you're wondering, well, okay, so there's this throng of people, and this woman touches Jesus. She's healed. Why, why did Jesus put her on the spot? Why did he bring her out of the privacy of anonymity and bring her out and expose her in front of everybody? Well, I think there's a couple of reasons. Number one, he wanted the relationship to be personal and not just some nameless act. Um, Jesus is more than the healer of our body. He's also the lover of our soul. 
And so Jesus wants to be much more than your great physician. He also wants to be your savior and friend. And so he says, who touched me? He knew who touched him. But he wants to he wants to bring this out where there can be a relationship established. And he wanted, secondly, he wanted her faith to be in him and not in his robe. He didn't want her to think that just by touching cloth, that something maybe magical, mystical would happen. No, the faith that she had in him is what enabled her to be uh, healed. Um, so I think another reason that Jesus brings her out is the fact that faith cannot be held in private. You, you don't just have genuine faith in the Lord and you keep it all to yourself. It's got to be made public. I think that's one of the reasons that Jesus instituted baptism. Baptism is a public confession of our faith. And he wants this woman's faith to be made public. That brings us to verse 48. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Now, if you are reading along with me in something other than King James or New King James, you might not have seen the words be of good cheer. It's actually because in the better manuscripts of Luke, those words aren't there. However, in almost all all the manuscripts of Matthew, those words are there. So whether they're actually in Luke's gospel account or not is, is kind of beside the point because Matthew confirms that Jesus said those words, be of good cheer, be encouraged. And so Jesus reminds her that her faith is what was important. There's no magic here, only her belief in the supernatural power of Jesus. And so when Jesus said, go in peace, I think he's telling her, lady, I want you to leave here knowing that all is well between you and my father. There is peace for your heart. There is peace for your soul, peace for your mind, as well as healing for your body. Go in peace. Now, what I'd like to do is spend the rest of our time reflecting back on what we've just read, this historical event, this healing event, and bring in some other scriptures and, and, and look at six reasons to be of good cheer, even in the midst of pain and suffering. So the balance of our time, I want us to focus on six reasons to be of good cheer, even in the midst of pain and suffering. Number one. The Lord knows your pain. The Lord knows your pain. So are, are there hurting people all around the world? Yes. Are there starving people in certain parts of the world? People dying of malaria in other parts of the world? People dying of AIDS in some parts of the world? Well, of course. Well, how many of them do you know? Well, there's a whole lot of hurting people. I don't have a clue who they are. In all honesty, I struggle sometimes just to keep up with all the people in my own church family who are in pain and suffering. But guess what? The Lord doesn't have that problem. The Lord knows every single person on the planet who's going through pain. And he especially, with intimate knowledge, knows all of his children who are going through pain and suffering. And so the Lord knows all there is to know about you. He knows about your prognosis before you do. He knows whether or not it's curable by modern medicine or if it will require a miracle. The Lord knows whether or not the current pain you're dealing with will be the instrument of your death. He knows all those things. He sees your tears. He hears your cries. He knows your despair. I mean, after all, when the people of Israel were under the pain and the suffering of Egyptian bondage, didn't Jesus know? Yes. Listen to Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 to 25. The people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and they cried out for help. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God. And God heard their groaning. God remembered his covenant with Abraham and Isaac and with Jacob. God saw the people of Israel and God knew. God knew. So folks, listen carefully. Don't forget the Lord's omniscience while you're hurting. 
But don't allow the phenomenal nature of this truth to discount the personal nature of it. Yes, the Lord knows all, but he also knows you. He knows all the people who are currently suffering, but he also knows you. And you do not get lost in the all. You, whomever you are, you are not a muddled mess in, you're not a muddled nobody in the sea of humanity. You are somebody that God knows personally. He sees you. He hears you. He knows all the thoughts of your heart, mind, and soul. He knows the tears you dried with the clinics earlier today. He knows the worry in your heart, the anxiety. He knows your pain. Secondly, the Lord feels your pain. The Lord feels your pain. Many of you listening to me, you already know that Jesus is the one and only unique God-man. There's nobody else like Jesus. God flesh, God humanity, deity and humanity woven into one person, our beautiful kinsman redeemer, Jesus. And Jesus for 30 plus years lived life down here and he experienced all the worst that life in this sin-cursed world had to offer. He experienced it all. And so whatever pain you are going through, Jesus can relate to it. We're told in uh, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, that we have a wonderful high priest who can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Why? Because he went through it all himself. And therefore, he knows how to comfort you in your pain and your suffering. A third reason to be of good cheer, even in the midst of your pain and suffering, the Lord hears your prayers. The Lord hears your prayers. So uh, I want you to listen to Matthew chapter 9, verse 21. This is what the Lord, I mean, I'm sorry, the woman said to herself, if I only touch his garment, I will be made well. Folks, I believe those words that she said um, were essentially a prayer of belief from the depths of her heart. And even before the Lord's garment was touched, the Lord was aware of the desire of her heart. There is no doubt in my mind the Lord knew that she had prayed that prayer in her heart. And God does not turn a deaf ear to his hurting people, period. Doesn't happen. He is not hard of hearing. The very fact that he not only knows your pain and feels your pain, th th that fact ought to provide the impetus for us to even pray more and more, knowing that he has the wherewithal and the, the empathy to address our needs. Uh, listen to Hebrews 4, verse 16. Okay, so seeing that we have a high priest who can not empathize with our troubles and trials, quote, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. So, do you ever get a phone call and maybe you've got caller ID on your home phone or it's your cell phone and, and, and you see the number and the number is connected to a name in your address book and you're thinking, oh no, not him or her again. Now, now I, I don't ever do that. I mean, just for clarity. Um, but, you know, you see somebody and you're thinking, man, I don't, I don't have time for them right now. Because it seems like, I mean, some people, well, anyway, you, you, know, you know what I'm talking about. Or do you sometimes see somebody calling and you purposefully ignore it? Or you hit whatever button on whatever kind of phone you have that you know will automatically send it to voicemail? Well, guess what? The Lord never, ever does that. Nobody who is rightly related to him through Jesus ever calls to him and he ignores you. He never finds himself saying, you know what? I don't have time for him. I don't have time for her. Don't they know I'm busy running the universe? Never. He never sends you straight to voicemail. Never. So I want you to take comfort in knowing the Lord hears your prayers. Now, just because you do not get exactly what you asked for when you asked for it does not mean that he did not listen. 
that that's one thing that's been a little frustrating through the years is that when maybe somebody comes to see me in my office or we talk on the phone and they ask me to consider this or to consider that and then conclude that just because I didn't do this or that, that well, Jeff doesn't listen. That's not fair. Now, I haven't had that experience in quite a while, but that's not fair. And so I did listen, but maybe in my spirit, I just didn't believe it was the best thing to do. Well, just because the Lord doesn't do exactly what you ask when you want him to do it doesn't mean he didn't listen. Know that he listens. Number four, the Lord escorts you in your pain. The Lord escorts you in your pain. Folks, listen to Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. Listen to, listen to the anguish initially in, in Paul's pen. At my first defense, no one came to stand by me, but all deserted me. May it not be charged against them, but the Lord stood by me and strengthened me. And then Isaiah 41 verse 10. The Lord God said this to his people Israel. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Number five, the Lord governs your pain. The Lord governs your pain. Boy, listen to 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Paul writes very honestly to the Corinthian believers, For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. So folks, notice with me a couple of things. The Lord governs your pain and uses it to burn your dross and increase your trust. He uses it to burn your dross and increase your trust. Paul said, look, I, I realize God put me through what I, I did not think was bearable. And that was to help me not trust in myself, but to trust in him. Read with me 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 16 to 18. Paul says there, we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. I don't know whether you are catching this, but look, the Lord governs your pain and uses it to give you an eternal perspective and a deeper longing for heaven's glory. He governs your pain and uses it to give you an eternal perspective and a deeper longing for heaven's glory. Now think about this. We just read in chapter 1 Paul's pain and suffering being a burden too heavy to carry. And now in chapter 4, it's a light momentary affliction. See, when, when, when you view heaven and the eternal nature of our existence there, it has a way of putting our current pain and suffering in perspective. It has a way of putting it in perspective. So speaking about some people who have had an extraordinary load, we, we've had uh, some folks go through that in our church's life experience. T two ladies come to my mind, Kathy O'Shea. Miss Faye Yule, Miss Kathy, some of you will recall, lost a daughter-in-law and two grandchildren in a wreck. Miss Faye Yule lost her husband and two grandchildren in a fire. Uh, God somehow in his sovereignty, in his providential care can take great pain, great suffering, and just produce in us a Christ-likeness that could not have been produced otherwise. And then number six, a sixth reason that we can be of good cheer, even in the midst of our pain and suffering, the Lord 
allows your questions. He allows your questions. The Lord allows your questions as long as they come from a sincere longing to better understand God's providence and purposes. If you, as I often will say, if you, if you ask your questions with palms open up toward the Lord and just wanting to know why, why, I think that's okay. But if you close those hands and you raise your fists and you demand answers, that's not okay. Job asked, why did I not die at birth, come out of the womb and expire? Why do you hide your face and count me as an enemy? Even the Lord Jesus himself on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So, folks, some of you, as you go through what it is you're going through, for some of us, as we go through it at some point in the future, you can ask your questions. God can sure handle them. There's no doubt about that. Just make sure your attitude toward him is what it ought to be. Now, because of everything I've said thus far, my final exhortation to you is this. The Lord deserves your trust. He, de- he deserves your trust and mine. Last two verses of our text, uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 49 and 50. While he was still speaking, that is, to the woman, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. But when Jesus heard it, he answered him saying, Do not be afraid. Only believe, and she will be made well. And in a matter of moments, she was. As Charles Spurgeon once explained, when we can't trace God's hand, be sure you trust his heart. When you can't trace his hand and figure out what he's doing, trust his heart. So at one of the most lowest moments of Martin Luther's life, Martin Luther, one of those Reformation leaders, Uh, It was when his daughter, Magdalena, who was barely 14 years of age, uh, was stricken with the plague. And unfortunately, doctors tried and they were unsuccessful and she too would die. Uh, When the carpenters were nailing down the lid of her coffin, it's reported that Luther screamed out, Hammer away! Hammer away! One day she'll rise again. One day she'll rise again. Be of good cheer, my brothers and sisters. One day the healer will permanently heal all of his children, and so shall we forever be free from all the dreadful effects of sin and the curse. Be of good cheer, my brothers and sisters. One day all tears will be wiped away. All sorrow and grief and pain and sorrow will be eternally removed. For all of those former things shall be passed away. Be of good cheer. The healer is here. Let's pray. Father, thank you for historical truths like these we've looked at this evening that enable us to be of good cheer in our historical lives. And moving forward, who knows what pain and or suffering any of us might have to deal with, physiological, emotional, spiritual, financial. But Lord, I'm so grateful that however heavy the load might get in the here and now, one day all of those burdens will be removed. Lord, thank you for your ability to meet our needs and for all the other reasons that I've already preached and taught about reasons to be of good cheer, I thank you for them as well. Encourage my brothers and sisters who need it most with these truths. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. As always, thank you for joining me. Uh, Have a good rest of the week. Stay faithful, and Lord willing, I'll see you on Sunday.